in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, in verses 6 through verse 11, Peter writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's necessary as we see here in this passage to watch for the activity of Satan in the religious realm. Satan is a roaring lion. He is described as one who is walking about. His purpose is to destroy us, uh, that he may devour us is the way in which Peter puts it here. He sets forth our duty to resist him uh, in the faith. And so we have an adversary that's there. He needs watching uh, and our resistance. He is, in his efforts, always trying to oppose the cause of Christ. He is in opposition to what is right and what is good. His desire is for evil, for sin to be prevalent within our lives. And so we need to be ever watchful and ever on guard. One of Satan's most successful tools is that of indifference. It is subtle opposition in the form of respectability. Indifference is a negative form of opposition. He is opposing. How? By getting us to be indifferent. We are then opposing that which is right and good. Indifference, as defined by Webster, is having no concern or feeling, no interest, showing no preference, don't care attitude, don't care one way or the other, not for, not against, not one way, not the other way. There's a lot of areas in which we can be indifferent. It doesn't matter to us. The realm of religion, though, is not one of those ways. We cannot be indifferent relating to Christianity and to the cause of Christ. Because if you're not with Christ, you are against him. That's what Jesus expressed in Matthew, the 12th chapter, and verse 30. That you're either with me or you're against me. You're either gathering with me or you're scattering abroad. There's no middle ground of indifference where we just don't care one way or the other. Of no feelings. The salvation of soul and the eternal destiny of souls makes it of such a nature that one cannot be indifferent regarding these matters. And yet, a world in which we live tries to get us to be indifferent in relationship to religious matters. One area that causes indifference is that of, and we're talking about now, of course, in the, in the religious realm, but one area would be that of 
materialism. Materialism causes us to be indifferent regarding religious matters, regarding the cause of Christ. Materialism is described as the doctrine that physical well-being and physical possessions constitute the highest good in life. Now, if we look at our world today, it is consumed with materialism. That is the way that most people live. The doctrine of physical well-being, the doctrine that physical possessions constitute the highest good in life. It's that viewpoint that says a world in the hand is worth two in the bush. Whatever I can get in this world, that's it. That's what I need to strive for. That's why I need to encourage my or center my life upon. My life needs, needs to be directed as to what I can achieve. What's going to make me successful? What's going to make me get more in the world's possessions? While the figure might be a little bit old and is no doubt changing all of the time, it has been stated that the, in the United States you have one-sixth of the world's population controlling one-half of its goods. As I say, those figures might be a little bit different now, but the very nature of that is we want more. We want success, and success being defined as possessions, wealth, money. And the more that I have of it, the more successful I am. Jesus, in Luke, the 12th chapter, in verse 15, says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Here's Jesus' philosophy, that a man is not measured by the abundance of things that he possesses. If he has great riches, that doesn't make him successful. That's not what life consists of. If a man is totally poor, does not mean that he's not successful, even though that's the way in which the world judges success. That's the success of the Gentiles, as using the language of the Bible in regards to the world. They push and push, and sadly, a lot of Christians have fallen into that realm of being materialistic in their thinking. This world's goods is all that's important. Listen to how young people are brought up today. Take this job. Study in this area. Why? Because you'll make a lot of money. You'll be able to have a lot of prestige and power. That is a materialistic viewpoint of life. And yet, that's the way in which young people are taught today. They're taught it at, in home by the parents and by the way in which the parents live. They're taught it in the school system. You know, you don't want to go into that area of study because what good is it going to do you? In other words, you're not going to make a lot of money if you go in that area of study. So you don't really want to do that. Why? Because our society is a materialistic society. We're all familiar with the Laodiceans. Church at Laodicea, Revelation, the third chapter. And we're all very familiar with Jesus' statement to them, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. And Jesus is addressing their lukewarmness. You are lukewarm. You are, to a great extent, indifferent. 
That's the idea that he's presenting. You're not cold, you're not hot, you're just in a state of indifference. You don't care one way or the other. But question, how many of us know why they're like that? Why were they neither cold nor hot? They say, well, I don't know. Well, God tells us. Look at verse 17 of Revelation 3. Because thou sayest. Now then we're starting, to, we're going to learn the reason they are neither cold nor hot. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. What they didn't know, he says, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's the way they really were when they were claiming, why well, I'm rich. I have all of these goods. I'm successful in life. They were materialistic in their thinking, and their materialistic thinking caused them to be lukewarm or indifferent. Neither cold nor hot. And that's the idea of indifference. Our society today, and within the United States, we have become very rich. We are a wealthy nation. Some have expressed it that our, uh, the poor in other nations our poor are rich in relationship to them. Now here you have our poor and their poor, poor in other nations. Our poor is rich in relationship to what they have in other nations, the poor in other nations. It shows the richness of our nation. And if you go into foreign lands, you immediately start seeing that attitude of uh, other nations in relationship to all Americans. You're all rich. And we say, well, I'm not rich. To them you are. Because we have things, even though we might, you know, we talk about the middle class and we're just all middle class people generally, uh, and we're getting less and less, and the rich are getting richer and richer, and the middle class are getting pushed down into the poor class. But we have far more of this world's goods than people in, the, in foreign nations can even dream of, generally. We are a rich people. The Laodiceans. I'm rich. Have need of nothing. Really, what do we have need of? If we have need of something, don't we generally go and get it? And what we think we have needs of, aren't they generally our wants instead of our needs? In foreign lands, those things that we think are needs, well, they're not needs there. because we're rich. But that richness has caused us to be indifferent from a spiritual standpoint. Just like the Laodiceans. What do we have need of? Have need of nothing. But from a spiritual standpoint, we do have need. We need to ha have need of God. But the materialism says and causes us to think, have need of nothing don't need God. Why should I need God? That's why if you go into 1 Corinthians, the first and second chapters, first chapter in particular, that Paul talks about that it's not going to be the rich of this world, but the poor of this world. Why? Because the rich are led to that feeling because of the materialistic attitude of, I have need of nothing. I don't have need of God. And so from a general standpoint, the rich do not accept Christianity. 
And we're talking about generalities now. We're not talking about individually. But from a general standpoint, those who are rich, their attitude, I don't need it. It was expressed a few years ago uh, very well by Bill Gates. He had better things to do with his time than to go sit in a worship service uh, an hour a week. His time was more important than that. Well, what is he? He's the richest man upon the earth now, but he's also poor from a spiritual standpoint. If you go back in the Old Testament, and God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt with a strong hand. They take, we would say, loot many times. Uh, it was really the pay that the Israelites deserved for the years of servitude that they had served the Egyptians. As a result, they take all of the gold and silver and all of the riches of I Egypt as they leave. Here now they are wealthy people. God brings them to the land of, of promise. After having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, they go in and they take the land. They become prosperous. And there's a generation now that arises that no longer realizes the good that God has done for them. And they go into apostasy. God brings an oppressor upon that nation. And so they cry to God for deliverance, and God sends them a judge who delivers them from the oppression. After that deliverance takes place, they again become prosperous. And what happens? <clears throat> They're indifferent again. <laughs> and that indifference again leads to apostasy. And you have a continuing cycle of this taking place during that 300 plus years of the period of the judges. In which, when they become rich, they leave God. When they are oppressed, they turn to God. And God delivers them. And they become rich again and leave God. The materialism causes the indifference to come upon people. And we see it throughout all time. That when we become rich, we turn away from God. When we become materialistic in our thinking and in our minds, we turn from Him. We become indifferent. That's why the Laodiceans were neither hot nor cold. That's why they were indifferent. And we see it within the church of our Lord today. You know, sometimes you see someone who obeys the gospel and they're just on fire. They're so excited. And people who have been members of the church a long time sit back and say, yeah, just give him a couple of years and he'll be like us. They might not put it that way, but that's what they're saying. And that's what happens. We become indifferent over time. And a lot of that is because of the materialism that we have. Just don't have any needs. Don't have need for God thus. The cure is set forth in God's word though is seen when Satan tempted Jesus. And, say, and he tells him, think just of this world see that you're hungry, you see these rocks over here, turn them into bread. Think only of the physical. Don't think of the spiritual, just think of the physical. Your physical needs, your physical wants, that's materialism. And Jesus' response is, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you want to know what's truly important, it's not the physical, it's not gaining this world's goods, it's not the materialistic attitude that says 
this physical well-being and physical possessions constitute the highest good in life. No, that's not success. That's not being the highest good even. What does constitute the highest good is that of God's Word. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's the attitude that remembers, as Paul puts it to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out of. There's the old statement of man who was wealthy in town, and he died, and a couple of individuals, and watching the funeral procession, one said to the other, I wonder how much he left. And the old story goes, the other one responded, he left it all. We hear that, and we've heard that throughout the years, but it's very true. One person put it that they've never seen a hearse pulling a trailer with his possessions. Every once in a while, someone will, upon death, uh, they, loved ones will want them to have a certain possession in the casket and be buried with that possession. But that possession does that individual no good. Even I heard of one, read of one story where a woman wanted to be buried in her Cadillac. And they gave her a request, buried her in her Cadillac. Guess what? That Cadillac went no place and did her no good when she was dead. Howard Hughes, you know, he was, if uh, you go back in his history, it's not too far back and you would find someone who's a faithful gospel preacher. I believe it was his grandfather. Yet here he is, might have been great-grandfather, but here he is a wealthy man. And he had that attitude, that materialistic attitude, that physical wealth constituted the highest good in life, but not at the end of his life he didn't. Because he died while rich, a poor, beggarly individual. Unkept. Not even clean. His riches and wealth did him no good. We have the historical account of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, a poor beggar. The rich man having all of the wealth that he needed. And yet, here's when Lazarus dies, the angels take him and carry him into Abraham's bosom. The rich man... No doubt when he died, he had a wonderful funeral and buried in a tomb and doesn't say any of those things about the Lazarus, though. Yet, that rich man was in torments. What good was all of his riches then? Jesus gave the parable of here is a man who his crops bring forth abundantly. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'll take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry for I have no needs now. Everything is satisfied. And Jesus says, thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then who shall these things be? What good is it going to do you that you have all this stored up? Absolutely no value to you. And yet how many times do we center our life upon those things? Paul would say it in Colossians 3 and verse 5, to mortify therefore your members which are upon this earth. 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, and evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That desire for more and more and more and more things, things of this world, covetousness. And so that becomes idolatry. That's what we live for. That our, becomes our God. As a result, religious matters become indifferent to us. They're not that important within our life any longer. And so, if we miss a Sunday night, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, I've got better things to do. I've got more important. I've got to live my life. I've got to get these things. I've got to take care of all of these things that I have. Or if I miss a Wednesday night, what difference does it make? I'm out work. I work hard and I deserve my time off now. You see, the wealth and the materialistic attitude affects our religious being and our spirituality. And we become indifferent to it. We've got to make, be on guard that we do not allow the things of this world to take precedence over our spirituality and that God comes first above all, even our own self. But then a second problem of religious indifference would be the inconsistency of those who claim to be Christians. The Bible even recognizes this problem. Look at Philippians 1 and verse 27 when he says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Your behavior is to be as the gospel of Christ. What it, there's apparently some whose behavior is not as the gospel. They claim to be Christians, but they're not living that way. In Titus 2 and verse 10, Paul would write, Not poor warning, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the gospel or the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. They are adorned the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ. They are to live the Christian life faithfully. That's their lifestyle. You know, which one, if we had to consider, which one's worse? For that individual to proclaim God is dead, as Thomas Altizer did back in the 1960s. And say, God is dead. Or that individual who claims to believe God, but li then lives as if God is dead. Now which one is really worse? Or does it really make any difference? Which one is worse, to have a zeal without any knowledge? or to have a knowledge without any zeal. We all know of individuals who are very zealous toward God, but they have no knowledge of what God says or God's Word. They just seem, they're so excited and they're on fire for the Lord, but they have absolutely no knowledge of what He says. They're just going out there and they're just so excited, but they have no goal, they have no purpose, they have nothing directing their life they have no knowledge. But then don't we see a lot of members of the Lord's church who have a lot of knowledge, but they have no zeal? There's no fire in them anymore. It's gone out. They're just going through the motions of Christianity now. Now which one is worse in that situation? Well, they're both bad. Neither one of them is of any value. 
we as those individuals who are supposed to uphold purity of life. How many times do we succumb to the pressures of compromise, though, within our life? God is first in my life. I love God with all my being. But I can't seem to make it back on Sunday night to services. Or I can't seem to make it on Wednesday night. But I love God more than anything, even above my own life. Do you really? Is that really what you have? I love God and want to serve Him, but then as I leave this building, I don't do anything about it. I don't live for Him. I don't serve Him. I don't work for others. I don't live the Christian life. I live for myself, and I live for the things of this world. And if the person in the world should see me, they really don't see anything different than anyone else in the world. I'm not out teaching them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not out doing good works for God, and proclaiming the love of God to a lost and dying world. I've been going through the things of this world just like everyone else. But yet, here's the proclamation. I love God first and foremost. He's first in my life. But God knows better. No doubt those Laodiceans, if you ask them, you know, do you love God? Well, absolutely. Why would you even think I didn't? But yet they were lukewarm and indifferent. when we have that problem of someone who claims to be a Christian, claims to love God, but then they live differently from it, or they speak in ways that are different from the Christian way of speaking. They dress in such a way that instead of upholding righteousness and godliness, it leads to the lust of this world. Then it causes problems for Christianity. Because others think there's no difference between Christianity and the world. And it causes it, well, I'm just as good as they are. Why should I go over here? Well, I remember old so-and-so over there. He is... <laughs> You know, he's a, a evil. Why would I want to be associated with that? He speaks in a way that is ungodly. He might, uh, oh, he might not curse, but you know, he, he speaks like the devil half the time. He uses foul language. He's crude. Why would I want to be associated with someone like that now? You try and convert that individual. A lot of individuals, and you see this uh, because historically we see that women are generally more spiritually minded than men, and so the, a woman uh, here is a Christian and her husband is not. And I come along and say, oh, you know, there's so much that I want. I wish my husband was a member of the church. I wish that I could convert him. And so many times with those individuals, you want to say, you need to be converted yourself first. Until you start living the Christian life, you're never going to convert him. Until you show him in your life that God comes first in your life, you're not going to convert him. When you skip the services, you're not going to convert him. When you allow him to interfere with your doing what is right and what God wants you to do, you're not going to convert him. No doubt many of you heard Brother George Darling talking about his life before becoming a Christian. How that he would try to prevent his wife from attending services. Even to the point that one time when it was pouring down rain goes out and disconnects the car so that it won't start. 
And instead of staying home, what does she do? She bundles up the kids and she starts walking in the rain to come to services. It made him feel bad enough that he fixed the car, goes and picks her up, attends services, and he becomes a gospel preacher as a result. More than anything that preacher said that caused him to obey the gospel, it was the faithfulness of that wife. But what if she had said, well, you know, it's raining. It's probably a little cold since she had to bundle up the kids. And, you know, I can just stay home this time. It won't really make any difference. It's really inconvenient getting out in this. And Brother Darling probably never would have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the difference? One lives a Christian life, the other proclaims it, but doesn't live it. And it influences others. We cause, or we are an influence upon other individuals, whether we want to be or not. And when we proclaim one thing and live something else, it's going to draw people to God, or it's going to push them away from Him. There is a problem, though. And while we see many times the imperfections of man, that man just falls down and sins. He doesn't do what he needs to do. We real, need to realize, yes, there is that human side, and man is frail, he's weak, and he's not always going to do what's right. But there is that divine side, that perfect side, that is always right, no matter what man might do. And we need to do right no matter what. We need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ through faith in God, and we need to repent of our sins, turning away from them to turn to Him in His appointed way. We need to make that confession of our faith that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yes, that I then upon that will be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But then as I come up out of that baptismal water, I'm now a new creature. I have no condemnation. I stand before God pure and clean and whole. But now then, it's my duty as a Christian to live for him and to adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ or the doctrine of Christ. To truly live as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. To show that my citizenship is not here upon this earth, but my citizenship is in heaven. And thus we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Just passing through... <laughs> Not centering our life upon the things of this world, but centering our life upon spirituality, upon God and His will. Now, if that hasn't been your life, maybe you've just proclaimed your love for God, but you haven't shown it by your life. Or you've just proclaimed your Christianity, but you haven't demonstrated it. Then why not change your life this morning? And really put Him first within your life. Really love God first and foremost within your life, above all things else. And truly be that shining example in a world of darkness. Going out and teaching others the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you need, as a child of God, to repent of your sins this morning, and we would encourage you to come to make those things right with God so that you can have that salvation in heaven. You need to come do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.